And first things first, we got to talk about this China debt trap diplomacy. You hear it a lot in the mainstream media. There's never really any evidence of it. You probably remember the case of the Uganda, the airport in Uganda, which was said by Western media to have been seized by China because Uganda couldn't pay back its debts. Of course, that never happened. There was no such seizure. It's always myth. It's always a lie. But nonetheless, uh, it's important to address this because it is constantly in the media. And of course, now you have the Sri Lanka situation, the unrest in Sri Lanka. You had the prime minister resign there. You have uh, masses of people in the streets very frustrated, especially by the economic situation, because in Sri Lanka, the inflation crisis and the economic crisis, both of them have hit Sri Lanka like a tidal wave. And uh, there's been a government transition there. And, and so the, a lot has been made of how it's China's fault. It's China's fault. It's China's fault. China was the one who put Sri Lanka in this situation. But is that true? It's not true at all. And I'm going to go over a few pieces of information. Uh, there's one from Chinese media, Global Times, an article. And then there is a new study looking into Africa because oftentimes uh, China and its financial and economic investments are targeted uh, when it comes to Africa and how China deals with African countries. So we're going to look at a new study from Debt Justice, which talks about what is actually the character of debt for the African continent, who is leveraging debt onto the African continent, how are African countries sort of uh, uh, dispersing and dividing their debts, uh, who is providing the debts, right, uh, or who is providing the lending, which leads to the debts. So we're going to do that. So first things first, let's look at what uh, China has to say, or what the Global Times, I should say, the Global Times uh, paper has to say about Sri Lanka's debt crisis. Because what's interesting is that most of Sri Lanka's debt is actually Western held. But you don't hear about that. You only hear that it's China. It's China's fault. So here is what Hussein Askari, writing for the Global Times, has to say. He says there's no Chinese debt traps. That's the point here. There is no Chinese debt traps. So he uh, uh, he says the global inflationary crisis in 2021, more dramatically in 2022, triggered a Sri Lankan default on payment of $78 million in matured foreign bonds in April 2022. On May 18th, the central bank in Sri Lanka declared the country was in preemptive default status. Political unrest followed as the government failed to pay, failed to provide fuel and imported food. Prices have dramatically increased while the government's ability to provide foreign currency, currency to support continued to imports to dried up. The Western and Okay, the Western and components of the Indian mainstream media, think tanks at research centers, and even many government officials have made the Sri Lankan Ham Hambantota port a globally known name and the main example of China's debt trap diplomacy, although this was entirely proven to be a false story. As our own research and interviews with experts will show here, the entire story of China being the source of Sri Lanka's debt is fake through and through. Who owns Sri Lanka's external debt? Two essential facts are ignored when the media in the West deal with the external debt in Sri Lanka, the composition of the debt and the real causes of the debt. Exactly as is the case in Pakistan, China's share of the external public debt of Sri Lanka is only 10%. Western financial institutions, including the private credit markets and their ally Japan, hold the lion's share of the debt. So that's the important information here. China only holds 10% of Sri Lanka's external debt. The rest of it is divided among Western financial institutions, private creditor markets, which tend to be Western as well. And of course, their Japan, which, of course, which has a pretty predatory relationship financially with, with most countries it deals with that are smaller than it. So according to the Sri Lankan Department of Foreign Resources, the composition in percentage terms of the foreign debt in Sri Lanka in April 21, 2021 was as follows. International capital market borrowing, 47%. So think of things like the, the IMF, but also private capital, private corporations, uh, private monopolies lending Sri Lanka money. Asian Development Bank, 
China, 10%, Japan, 10%, the World Bank, 9%, India, 2%, and then there were others at 9%. Thus, a simple look at the facts that usually are ignored or, or blacked out shows that China is not what it is being portrayed to be. The real culprits, as shown here in this article, are from the same Western countries in which the China debt trap narrative was concocted. First, borrowing in international capital markets. After a devastating civil war ending in 2009, the government of Sri Lanka resorted to expensive borrowing from the international bond markets for a reconstruction process. These sovereign loans from mostly Western financial investors like American BlackRock and British Ashmore constitute the greatest part of the external debt of the country at 47%. It was the scramble to repay some of the debt that matured in 2017 that pushed the Sri Lankan government to offer the Hembentota port for lease. China accepted the offer in return for $700 million, $790 million that was used to repay the debt to the international markets, not to China. So basically China said, okay, uh, we are going to lease out this port for you. And that money can then be used not to repay us, but to then repay who you are in debt to. So China is actually helping uh, act as a solution here and not the problem. So the bond market is a brutal profit-seeking force that has a secondary market where investors sell the sovereign debt of troubled countries, the so-called vulture funds that buy the debt with big discount from the big in from the investors to later demand full payment from the debtor nations. Repayment must be made on time, otherwise the country will be shut down from lending. The vulture funds sue sovereign debtors in UK and US courts where under the threat of seizing the assets of those nations abroad, the courts generally rule in favor of these vulture funds. So Argentina was really racked with this uh, not too long ago, probably still is. But basically, you see the brutality of what we call the bond market, finance capital, uh, really hedging bets and investing in the debts of countries through vulture funds, which then our, our repayment is demanded fully and right away, and, and they can't do it. So then you have the trade deficit. Sri Lanka has a major dependency on imports of oil and gas for, and their refined products for transport and power generation. In recent years, the global prices have increased, but in 2021 to 2022, they've skyrocketed. These items, in addition to fertilizers, constitute the most part for the most part of the imports of the country. In 2020, total exports were 10 billion, while imports stood at 16 billion, which is a deficit of 6 billion. In 2021, the deficit increased to 8 billion as exports amounted to 12 billion and imports to 20 billion. Consequently, the current account deficit widened significantly to 4% of the GDP in 2021 compared to 1.5% of GDP registered in 2020. So essentially, Sri Lanka is having trouble with its deficit. It's not producing enough to export and its imports are flooding the country and they can't handle it. They can't absorb it. Third, collapse of the tourism sector. According to Sri Lankan Tourism Authority, earnings from tourism has been a major contributor to the surplus in services accounted over many years. The income in foreign currency and level of employment were substantial until their collapse. And then you have the Easter. The reason why this is the Easter terror attack by suicide bombers in 2019 was a major setback for the tourism sector. And then the 2020 COVID-19 outbreak, which reduced the number of tourists visiting the country to a trickle. And so if you look at the numbers, foreign tourism income reached 3.9 billion in 2017, 4.4 billion in 2018, 3.6 billion in 2019, just 682 million in 2020, 507 million in 2021. So you see that huge drop off by many billions of dollars lost in the tourism sector. So, you know, Sri Lanka, the way it's being described here, its economic arrangement, uh, you can see this is the case for many countries, many underdeveloped, quote unquote, underdeveloped countries, overexploited countries, which have to rely on Western creditors, Western financiers, because they're dominated by them. And then when the going gets rough, they don't have a diversified economy that can absorb the shocks. And they also don't have much government intervention in the economy in ways that can stabilize it. And then you see the result here. And then you have the decline in remittances. Annual remittances over the past two decades have represented nearly a fourth of total credits to the external current account on average. And exceptionally, this share exceeded more than one third in 2020. And they declined from $7 billion in 2020 to just $5 billion in 2021. So another loss in $2 billion of revenue coming in. The government of Sri Lanka has, play, has been plagued by persistent 
fiscal deficits for decades, compelling the government to continually borrow from both domestic and foreign markets, and in doing so, accumulating public debt. As a result, the large fraction of government revenue and foreign currency inflows to the country are required for debt service payments, permitting little leeway for productive investments. So does that sound familiar? That's kind of like what the IMF has done all over the world. Sri Lanka is is part of this is is part of this situation. They overall this overall trend, right, of being overexploited, super exploited by financiers hiding behind the guise of uh, uh, lenders, IMF, World Bank. All of these, the vulture funds, all of these forces are seeking to loot Sri Lanka. And they've done so successfully. And now that we're in this economic crisis, Sri Lanka is in a huge crisis. So China does not have a magic wand to change the conditions of nations. The reason China managed to eliminate extreme poverty and build the world's most productive economy is through hard work and massive investments in infrastructure and labor force through education. China's role in Sri Lanka is considered a positive since it focuses on developing the productive aspects of the economy, such as modernizing the infrastructure. Contrary to the debt trap narrative, China is not Sri Lanka's largest creditor, but rather it is the largest foreign direct investor in the country. China's investments in Sri Lanka are long-term projects that gradually increase the productivity of the economy, but they do not represent a quick fix. What is needed from the U.S. and Europe, rather than pushing the thoroughly debunked debt trap narrative against China, is to join hands with China in the Belt and Road Initiative, to assist in rapidly raising the productive capacities of Sri Lanka through investments and long-term low-interest credits for infrastructure projects, industries, and modern agricultural production. So basically, you know, that article just lays it out. China's only 10% of Sri Lanka's external debt. Sri Lanka is in debt to basically a series of vultures, private and public lenders. And these lenders have placed Sri Lanka in basically a, a virtual default situation, a consistent default situation. Austerity reigns supreme, and the people are suffering, and now there's unrest there, but it's been blamed on China. And so that was an article from the Global Times. And so some may th say, hey, Danny, that article's from the Global Times. That can't be reliable. Well, I mean, that's that's an opinion, of course, and that's an opinion probably shared by many Americans and Westerners because of the low public opinion of China. The propaganda against China has been effective. But this hasn't just been said by, uh, uh, by Chinese media. And this isn't something that's necessarily new either. What the U.S. loves to do is it loves to bring up issues like debt trap diplomacy, quote unquote, and act like it's the new thing, that it's it, that it is a new problem or a problem that's just always always exists and now it's time to make headlines again, right? So it's always feels fresh. It's always supposed to feel fresh in the minds of those who have been propagandized by the corporate media. Well, the corporate media itself has published works debunking the Chinese debt trap narrative. And uh, one of my favorite authors is Deborah Brottengam who works for John Hopkins University. She's traveled all across the African continent, wrote a great book called The Dragon's Gift uh, about China's economic um, relations with African countries. And so she actually wrote, a co-authored an article last year. So this wasn't that long ago. She co-authored an article in The Atlantic talking about how the debt trap is a myth. And there you go. This is 2021. This is last year. The Chinese debt trap is a myth. And, the, and this talks about Sri Lanka. So that this is interesting. The narrative wrongfully portrays Beijing and the developing countries it deals with. So this is co-authored with Meg R with Rithmeyer. This was written in February of 2021. So we're talking about a year and a half ago. Before all of the unrest in Sri Lanka uh, came to a head like it has in the last several weeks. So it says, China, we are told, inveigles poor countries into taking out loan after loan to build expensive infrastructure they can't afford. Hold on one second. I'm going to make it bigger. Uh, they can't afford and will yield only few benefits, all with the goal of Beijing eventually taking control of these assets from its struggling borrowers. As states around the world pile on debt, to combat the coronavirus pandemic and bolster flagging economies, fears of possible seizures have only amplified. 
Seen this way, China's internationalization, as laid out in programs such as the Belt and Road Initiative, is not simply a pursuit of geopolitical influence, but also, in some tellings, a weapon. Once a country is weighed down by Chinese loans like a hapless gambler who borrows from the mafia, it is Beijing's puppet and in danger of losing a limb. The prime example of this is the Sri Lankan port of Hambantota. As the story goes, Beijing pushed Sri Lanka into borrowing money from Chinese banks to pay for the project, which had no prospect of commercial success. Onerous terms and feeble revenues eventually pushed Sri Lanka into default, at which point Beijing demanded the port as collateral, forcing the Sri Lankan government to surrender control to a Chinese firm. The Trump administration points out Hanbon Tota to warn of China's strategic use of debt. In 2018, former Vice Pre President Mike Pence called it debt trap diplomacy, quote unquote, a phrase he used through the last days of the administration in evidence of China's military ambitions. Last year, erstwhile Attorney General William Barr raised the case to argue that Beijing is loading poor countries up with debt, refusing to renegotiate the terms, and then taking control of the infrastructure itself. So this is all across the political establishment, right? And the liberal class is repeating this over and over and over again. It's not just the GOP. It's also the liberal class. Michael Ondate, one of Sri Lanka's greatest chroniclers, once said, in Sri Lanka, a well-told lie is worth a thousand facts, and the debt trap narrative is just that, a lie and a powerful one. Our research shows that Chinese banks are willing to restructure the terms of existing loans that have never actually seized an asset from any country, much less the port of Hambantota. A Chinese company's acquisition of a majority stake in the port was a cautionary tale, but it's not the one we've often heard. With the new administration in Washington, the truth about the widely, perhaps willfully misunderstood case of Hanban Tota port is long overdue. The city of Hanban Tota lies at the southern tip of Sri Lanka, a few nautical miles from the busy Indian Ocean shipping lane that accounts for nearly all of the ocean-borne trade between Asia and Europe, and more than 80% of ocean-borne global trade. When a Chinese firm snagged the contract to build the city's port, it was stepping into an ongoing Western competition through one, the United States, though one, the United States had largely abandoned. So here we go. It was the Canadian International Development Agency, not China, that financed Canada's leading engineer and construction firm, SNC Levelin, to carry out feasibility study for the port. We obtained more than 1,000 pages of documents detailing this effort through a Freedom of Information Act request. The study concluded in 2003, confirmed that the building of the port of Hanban Tota was feasible and supporting documents show that Canadians' greatest fear was losing the project to European competitors. SNC-Lavalin recommended that it be undertaken through a joint venture between the Sri Lankan Ports Authority and a private consortium on a build, own, operate, transfer basis, a type of project which, in which the single company receives a contract to undertake all the steps required to get such a port up and running and then gets to operate it when it is. The Canadian project failed to move forward, mostly because of vicissitudes of Sri Lankan politics. But the plan to build a port in Hambantota gained traction during the rule of the Rahapaksas. Melinda Rahapaksa, who served as president from 2005 to through 2015, and his brother Gotabaya, the current president and former president and minister of defense who grew up in Hambantota. They promised to bring big ships to the region a call that gained urgency after the devastating 2004 tsunami that devastated, pulverized Sri Lanka's coast and the local economy. So there you have it. I mean, this was, this port wasn't even start. It wasn't like China was building the port. That That is often what is misunderstood. This was a Canadian firm that was in on the mix. And then a second feasibility report produced in 2006 by Danish engineering firm Rambol made uh, that made similar recommendation of the plans, but put forward SNC Lavalin, Lavalin, arguing that an initial phase of the project should allow for the transport of non-containerized cargo, oil, cars, grain, to start bringing in revenue before expanding the port to be able to handle the traffic and storage of traditional containers. By then, the port in the city of Colombo, 100 miles away and consistently one of the world's busiest, had just expanded and was already pushing capacity. The Colombo port, however, was smack in the middle of the city, while Hambantota had a hinterland, meaning it offered greater potential for expansion and development. To look at a map of the Indian Ocean region at the time was to see an opportunity and expand was to see an opportunity in expanding middle classes everywhere. Families in India and across Africa were demanding more consumer goods from China. Countries such as Vietnam were growing rapidly and would need more natural resources. To justify its existence, the port of Hambon Tota would have to secure only a fraction of the cargo that went through Singapore, the world's busiest transshipment port. Armed with the Rambo report, Sri Lanka's government approached the United States and India. Both countries said no. But a Chinese construction firm, China Harbor Group, 
had learned about Colombo's hopes and lobbied hard for the project. China Exim Bank agreed to fund it, and China Harbor won the contract. So while a Canadian, while it seemed like a Canadian firm was going to build this, uh, by the time it was about to get up and running, nobody wanted to. So China said, okay, we'll do it. This was in 2007, six years before Xi Jinping introduced the Belt and Road Initiative. Sri Lanka was still the last in the last bloodiest phase of its long civil war, and the world was on the verge of financial crisis. The details are important. China Exim offered Exim Bank, Export-Import Bank, offered $307 million, 15-year commercial loan with a four-year grace period, offering Sri Lanka a choice between 6.3% fixed interest rate or one that would rise or fall depending on LIBOR, a floating rate. Colombo chose the former, conscious of global interest rates were trending higher during the negotiations and hoping to lock in what it thought would be favorable terms. Phase one of the port was completed on schedule within three years. For a conflict-torn country that struggled to generate tax revenue, the terms of the loan seemed unreasonable. As Salia Waxama... <laughs> wow, these names are hard. As Salia Wick... Ramusaira, the former chairman of the SPLPA, told us to get commercial loans as large as $300 million during a, the war was not easy. The same year, Sri Lanka also issued its first international bond with an interest rate of 8.25%. Both decisions would come back to haunt the government. Finally, in 2009, after decades of violence, Sri Lanka's war came to an end. Buoyed by the victory, the government embarked on, debt finance, on a debt finance push to build and improve the country's infrastructure. Annual economic growth rates climbed to 6%, but Sri Lanka's debt burden soared as well. In Hambon Tota, instead of waiting for phase one of the port to generate revenue, as the Rambo team had recommended, Mahinda Rahapaksa pushed ahead with phase two, transforming Hambon Tota into a container port. In 2012, Sri Lanka borrowed another $757 million from the China Exim Bank, this time at a reduced post-financial crisis interest rate of 2%. Right? Rahapaksa took the liberty of naming the port after himself. By 2014, Hanban Tota was losing money. Realizing they needed more experienced operators, the SLPA, the Sri Lankan Port Authority, agreed with China Harbor and China Merchants Group to have them jointly develop and operate the new port for 35 years. China Merchants was already operating a new terminal in the port of Colombo, and China Harbor had invested $1.4 billion in Colombo Port City, a lucrative real estate project involving land reclamation. But while the lawyers drove contracts, the political upheaval was taking shape. So there was a surprise election and there was political unrest and opposition candidates in Malaysia, the Maldives and Zambia, the incumbents, financial relations with China, allegations, corruption made for a potent campaign fodder. So a lot of this was used against the current president and steep payments on international sovereign bonds, which comprise nearly 40 percent. So as we said, 47 percent. For nearly 40% of the country's external debt put Saracena's government in dire fiscal straits almost immediately. When Saracena took office, so a new president, Sri Lanka owed more to Japan, the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank than to China. Of the $4.5 billion in debt service to Sri Lanka would pay in 2017, only 5% was because of Hanbun Tota. The central bank governors under both Rahapaksa and Saracena do not agree on much, but they both told us that Han Ben Tota and Chinese finance in general was not the source of the country's financial distress. But this, there was never a default. Colombo arranged a bailout from the IMF and decided to raise much needed dollars by leasing out the underperforming Han Ben Tota port to an experienced company, just as the Canadians had recommended. There was not an open tender, and the only two bids came from China Merchants, Chins, and China Harbor. Sri Lanka chose China Merchants, making it the majority shareholder with a 99-year lease, and used the $1.12 billion cash infusion to bolster its foreign reserves not to pay off China XM Bank. So there you have it. That's what happened. The country, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read the rest of this, uh, almost finished, but this is from uh, uh, Deborah Brottengam who is the Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins and the, an Associate Professor Meg Reithmeyer at Harvard Business School, hardly uh, Chinese, quote-unquote, state-affiliated media sources. And what they are saying here is that the port was built. No one really wanted to build it. There was not really many who wanted to invest in it. Sri Lanka's politics were very unstable. Uh, even at that time, the port was built. It didn't do too well because of the political unrest. This is a story a lot with Chinese investments too, guys. Uh, 
There was a lot of unrest, a lot of political instability. The port did not do well. The country was in a lot of debt. So the port was then leased to China, right? It was leased to China on a 99-year lease. And all of the money that China gave it, the China Merchants Group gave the um, gave Sri Lanka was not used to pay back China. It was used to pay off international creditors and Western financiers. So there is no debt trap with Sri Lanka, none. 